In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. So says the New World Translation. But is this a fair representation of the Greek? Well, in this video, we're going to answer that question. Let's get into it. Hi there, I'm Daryl Berling from Master New Testament Greek, here to help you with the tools, habits and system to master the Greek of the New Testament. If you're interested in learning Biblical Greek, then I encourage you to download my roadmap to master at masterntgreek.com slash roadmap. And this will help you to understand and get an idea of the overview of the program, how, how mastering Greek works, what it looks like, how long it takes, all that sort of jazz. Anyway, we'll talk more about that later on. The whole question of whether John 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God or the word was God comes down to the use of the Greek article. What is the article you might ask? Well I'm glad you asked. In English we have two articles. We have the definite article the and we have the indefinite article a. So the God and a God. Okay, so those are the two ways that we think of the article in English. Now, Greek actually has three ways of regarding nouns, and it doesn't really matter ultimately if a noun is has the article or does not have the article. It can be used in any of these three ways. Fundamentally, though, the point of the article, and this is a pun, I guess, the point of the article in Greek is to point to something for some reason, right? That's what it does, it points. So in English, the word the makes something definite. The television, the book, right? We're thinking of a particular book, it particularizes in English. But in Greek, it points to something and it has more of a grammatical function. Now, regardless then of whether the article is present or not present in Greek, really doesn't make any difference. It can be translated one of three ways or understood in one of three ways in the Greek language, regardless of whether the article is there or not there. Most of the time, if the article is there, it means that the word is definite. The book, the scroll, a scroll, or indefinite is another way it can be. So it can be definite with the article, but it can also be indefinite with the article, and it can be definite without the article, and it can be indefinite without the article as well. So we have the same kind of usage in Greek, with or without the article, as we have in English, definite or indefinite. But there's another way that Greek often uses nouns, we tend to use it this way as well, but we just don't think about it this way, and that is qualitatively. And that is to say that a noun can sometimes be used to ascribe a certain quality to another noun. And I think that's what's going on here in John 1.1. We're going to talk about that in just a moment and I'll explain why. So there are times when the word can be definite even though the article is absent. In fact, you can see here in this text the very first clause, in the beginning was the word. Now, in the beginning, notice there before RK there is no article. And what that tells us is that the article doesn't need to be there for it to be definite. There's only one beginning by definition. What's he referring to here? Well, clearly John is you know, speaking back, going back to Genesis 1.1 and using the ideas of Genesis 1.1. And we see this not just with the word beginning, but also with concepts like light and darkness and so on and so forth that we see throughout this chapter. So John is going back to Genesis 1. And so when he says, in the beginning was the word, he's thinking of the beginning of time, the beginning of creation. Now, by definition, there was only one of those, so by definition, the beginning is definite. The beginning. But there's no article here. So clearly, we don't need the article we do to be present to make something definite or indefinite either, or qualitative for that matter either. So the article then is neither here nor there for making something definite or indefinite, okay? Now there are other times where an article can be missing before a definite noun and so on, and we don't need to deal with that. You can see that just from this text here. So the question then becomes, how do we know here in, uh, with Kai Theos at the end of the, in this third clause in verse one, how do we know whether this is definite or indefinite? Should this have the article the in front of it? Is this and the word was the God, or should this be indefinite? And the word was a God, right? Are either of those correct, and why or why not? So I'm going to give you three reasons why this should be translated, and the word was God. Three reasons, okay? The first one is that if you're going to translate it as indefinite, a God, then you're really breaking even John's own understanding here. John is a first century 
uh, Jew, right? He's a monotheist. He believes there is only one God. And so he's hardly going to be saying, you know, God was, or the word was one of a number of gods. He does not believe in a number of gods as a Jew. And so he's hardly going to be writing, in the beginning was the word, and the word was one of the many gods who were out there in the world. No, John believes there's one God, and the very fact, again, like I mentioned, that he's going back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and taking you all the way back to that place where God was, indicates that he's making an equation here between hologos, the word, and that one God, right? That's the key thing here. So John is hardly saying this is one of many gods. He's a monotheist. He's holding that there is one God, and he's drawing an equivalence between hologos and and Theos, that one God that we see in Genesis 1.1. The second reason this should be called, this should be translated, and the word was God, is because this construction is what's called a predicate nominative. Now, in English, we typically have order our sentences in order from subject, verb, object. So the boy, the subject, hit, that's the verb, the ball, the object, right? And so we pretty stringently keep word order to that kind of order. Now, Greek doesn't work like that. In Greek, word order can be all over the place, and you can learn, we can discover, dis determine how we should translate into English by the endings on the word. And in this text, what we have here is we have two nominatives. We have theos, which is in the nominative, and we have hologos, which is in the nominative. Now, normally in Greek, the nominative is used for the subject. But here we have two of them. So we have to ask the question, well, how do we know which one is the subject and which one is the predicate? Which one is the subject and which one is being equated with the subject? And that's where the article comes in. In a predicate nominative, it is standard Greek to use the article prior to the subject and leave the article off the one that is the predicate. And that's exactly what we have here. Hologos, the word, was, ain, that's the verb there, and then theos, God. So the word was God. That's how we know that we're talking here about hologos and not theos, right? It's not saying God was the word. He's saying the word was God. And we can tell that because the article is before hologos, before the logos, the word. And so that's how we know that that is the subject. So the fact that there's no article before theos has nothing to do with how John wants us to take this or with the fact that this is indefinite. The whole point of leaving the article off the word theos there is to help us to realize that theos is not the subject. Logos is the subject. So that then leaves us with the final question of, well, what do we do with theos? Why is theos without the article, apart from the fact that it's in the predicate nominative? What significance does the lack of article have here for our understanding? And this is actually really important. Remember what I said earlier, that there were three ways that the Greek noun could be understood. It could be taken as definite, you know, that is the God. It could be taken as indefinite, that is a God. And it could be taken as qualitative. And that's what we have here. Typically, when a noun is to be understood as qualitative, it will not have the article prior to it. Now, it can occasionally have the article prior to it, but it's very clear that that's the way it's functioning in those contexts. But very often, when you have an anathrous noun, which we have here, it's often being used in this qualitative way. So here, by leaving the word uh, the, or the article, off theos, we're being allowed to maintain that there's a distinction between logos and theos. He's not saying that God was the word and the word was God and there's no distinction between those. He's leaving the article off again to help us to realize that the word has the quality of the God that we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, which then supports the idea that there is actually a trinity. And, well, maybe not a trinity, but at least more than one person in the Godhead. That's really a key part of what John is arguing here, and that's also a key part of why there is no article prior to theos in this construction, because John is being very careful here to maintain that the word has the qualities of God, but is not the same as the God we find in Genesis 1 verse 1. In other words, there are two persons, at least as far as this verse is concerned, in the Godhead. And just to conclude that, if John's purpose was to say that the word had the quality of God, then this is exactly the construction you'd want to use to convey that truth. So as it says in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus existed in the form of God, but he 
took upon himself, united himself, if you like, with humanity, becoming both human but also maintaining his deity, which exactly is what John is arguing for here in this passage. And this is what Christmas is really all about. God clothing himself with humanity so that he could be a sufficient savior for all men. As a human, he shares in the qualities that we have and is able to represent us. But as God, he is also able to bear the weight of our sin. And so Jesus then coming on Christmas, as we've had, is God becoming a man to provide grace so that we can have in this God-man forgiveness of sin in Christ then Jesus Christ who was born in Bethlehem on Christmas day at least we celebrate it we don't know the exact day but we celebrate it on Christmas day the the fact that Jesus was born as a human being this then tells us that God has united himself with man has taken up man's cause on himself and has provided for us a sufficient savior for our sins this means that all people everywhere have a savior to whom they can look for forgiveness of sins this means then that the coming of christ is a source of not only grace but also great joy for all of us who live on the earth for all of us who are sinners we have a savior in christ who is sufficient now if you're interested in learning more about how the greek works here or learning greek generally go download my roadmap to mastery at masterntgreek.com roadmap I want to wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas, rejoicing in the birth and coming of the grace that has been revealed to us in Christ Jesus so that all people everywhere can turn to a Savior who is sufficient. I look forward to seeing you again in the new year. Until then, keep taking small consistent steps toward mastery. See you then.